like to call this meeting to order. Will everybody raise and for the Pledge of Allegiance? Roll call. John O'Hare? Here. Patty Shin? Here. Amy Stilson? Here. John Maxey? Here. Mike Knoll? Here. Dennis Gardner? Here. I'm here. Absent none. First up on the agenda is consent agenda. Looking for a motion of support. Support. Moved by Noel, supported by Stilson to approve the agenda. Roll call. Shin? Yes. Gardner? Yes. Maxey? Yes. Noel? Yes. O'Hare? Yes. Stilson? Yes. And I'm yes. No nays. Jump back up. Audience comments. Do we have anybody tonight? Superintendent's report. Let's go up. Thank you. So this is our officially already our fourth week of school, which seems hard to believe with students. We're off to a good start for the school year already, and it's going quickly. I officially would like to welcome Ashley Dieter. Uh, she is fourth grade at Meyer, and Samantha Corian. Dr. Corian is with us for elementary music. So we're excited to have both of them here. Um, Ashley is actually a returning pioneer. She was with us before in GSRP, so we're excited to have her back with the Pioneer family. And uh, Dr. Corian is coming from Lakers, so we're excited to have her experience with us. So officially, welcome to both of you. I also want to welcome Chelsea Pomaville, our student representative to the board. She'll be sharing some student-centered information each month, so welcome and thank you, Chelsea, for being, being willing to take on this role. On Wednesday of this week, our Meyer and Frostick fourth graders will be attending Red Day, which is Rural Education Day at the Santa Lac County Fairgrounds with other fourth graders from around the county. They'll participate in different activities and centers focusing on rural education. In the past, there's been a lot of different centers and activities that they're doing, but some of them have included seeing live animals, learning about large animal veterinary care, bike and farm safety, learning about crops and conservation, and in the past, students have always returned with a bag of goodies, and they are so excited about their day. So we're looking forward to them going in a couple of days. We're looking forward to the return of honoring our students of the month, beginning again in October, and acknowledging our outstanding students in each of our buildings. Later this week, I'll be attending the MASA conference, which is the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators, and I'm looking forward to continuing my own learning this week. Later in tonight's meeting, you'll be hearing reports from building principals and department leaders, along with a report on spring assessment data, which is now um, not embargoed since that was finally lifted by the state. And Mr. Wood will be sharing the district's annual education report and continuity of learning plan. So lots of reports coming out tonight for information for everyone. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moody. Welcome aboard, Samantha and Ashley. Congratulations. <laughs> Curriculum and HR director's report. Thank you, Mr. Nowiski. Um, as Ms. Moody said, we are off and rolling for the 23-24 school year. Lots of things going on, so I'll highlight a couple of the things that uh, we have going on in the curriculum area. Um, first off, we had our first early release last Wednesday um, with professional development on that day, focusing on teachers completing their growth plans for, their, for our teacher evaluation process. To complement and build on what Ms. Moody said there, we do have some good news regarding district staffing. Um, we currently have all positions filled at Frostick, Meyer, Middle School, and Pioneer High School. At the high school, um, we're happy to announce uh, the office secretary, Darla Grabowski, has accepted the position. She's in the onboarding process. Um, we'll be joining the team soon, I believe this Friday. Um, we do still have two open positions at the high school. One, the high school business position, which unfortunately we have not received any qualified applicants yet. And then the other is the high school building sub, um, which kind of temporarily got put on hold a little bit with the last week's um, events. So we are in the process of still filling that as well. And then at Geiger, 
we currently have a teacher assistant position open. So making some progress on our staffing. We also have two pilots going on right now, one in social studies and one in writing. Um, overall, we're off to a good start. Uh, the materials have arrived and been distributed and teachers are beginning to work with these curriculums. In writing, we have a group of teachers at Meyer, Frostick, and the middle school piloting three curriculums. Frostick is piloting in kindergarten, second grade, and fourth grade. Meyer is piloting in first and third, and the middle school is piloting in fifth grade. One teacher from each grade level will pilot the Wonders 2023 writing curriculum. One teacher will pilot the Step Up to Writing, and a third in each grade will pilot the Six Plus One writing curriculum. These writing pilots are being supported by Jennifer Evans from the St. Clair Risa, um, and we plan to run the, run, run the writing pilot through the end of the first semester. We also have our social studies pilot going on. This we are working with TCI. Um, we had our implementation meeting for elementary and secondary teachers. This is a K-12 pilot um, broken down by grade level participation as well. So grade level leaders, so one from each grade, are piloting in Meyer and kindergarten, second grade and fourth grade. Frostick is piloting in first and third, and the middle school is piloting in sixth through eighth with the high school piloting by subjects, including American history, world history, civics, and econ. Uh, this pilot will run till the end of Thanksgiving break. Then we'll have the training for our other um, McGraw-Hill. We're gonna pilot their materials, their social studies K-12 content um, from early December, probably to the end of February, early March. So hopefully we'll have a, a recommendation for both of those uh, coming to the board later this year. We also have a, the Return to Learn Continuity of Learning Plan. Um, so you may have remembered this. We had to give updates on this every so often. We are required to give this update to the board every six months. Um, this is basically the details of our approach if we had to pivot back to virtual or online learning. Um, I don't hopefully see that happening, but we are required to present this, our plan to the board every six months. So we wanted to make sure we do that. And then finally, as Ms. Moody said, uh, we'll be covering the annual education report and our spring 2023 um, achievement results. So looking forward to sharing that with the board as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Bishop, Chief Financial Officer Report. Good evening, board. Um, I communicated this in a prior board note. However, I, I want to take a minute to bring forward information regarding our financial audit. Uh, during my preparation for the fiscal audit, I identified an error to, um, prior to the field work taking place that is worth mentioning to the board as a whole uh, prior to the audit presentation. Uh, this past fiscal year, we received a new categorical 147C2 called MIPSER's one-time deposit. Uh, this is to be accounted as a pass-through revenue, meaning that the district receives the funds through the state aid and then remits um, the same amount to ORS to help the unfunded liability. When the budget was presented to the board in June, the budget reflected the change in revenue without picking up the increase in expenditure. The solution to this involves the amount of funding that was budgeted to be transferred to the capital projects fund. So if you recall, we had excess uh, funds from the ESSER funds that were gonna be transferred over to the capital projects fund. Had the budget presentation reflected the correct revenue and expenditure amounts, um, the amount of funding to be transferred would have been adjusted accordingly. As such, the amount transferred to the capital projects fund will be net of this adjustment. The most important thing to note is the fund balance percentage that was presented to the board in June should largely be unaffected because of this. As a result of this change, I would expect to see an audit comment that reflects this change during the audit presentation. My goal tonight was to be transparent to the board um, prior to the actual audit presentation. During the actual field work that concluded a couple weeks ago, uh, the auditors were on site for two and a half days the shortest time in the last 10 years of, of an audit. They attributed this to the level of preparation prior to them starting and expressed their appreciation uh, on more than one occasion. I wanna thank my team at Central Office for their continued support and growth, evidenced in part by this year's success during that field work. So that's it, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. District staff report. Good evening, Board of Ed. I just have a couple updates. Um, 
I'll, I'll go with uh, oldest first. Uh, over the summer, we completed the uh, upgrade to the fiber optics between the high school and middle school. Currently, they were operating at one gigabit, but now they're at 10 gigabit. And then over the next few weeks, probably be operating at about 40 gigs, gigabit speeds between both buildings. Um, I know that everybody says everything's slow all the time, but I've noticed an improvement over here, uh, as well as some other things that, you know, some uh, nuances as far as visiting websites and stuff like that. Um, earlier in the week, uh, moving on to uh, two-way radios. Earlier, earlier in the week, uh, Dennis from Midcom uh, completed the digital transition. Now we're 100% digital with our two-way radio communications. Um, behind uh, Mr. Bishop there on the counter, you'll see uh, an example of one of the ha new handheld radios and an example of a base station with antenna and desk mic that's going to be in every office. I think most of the offices have them now, maybe, and if not, they'll have them in the next day or so. So that equipment is over there for you to take a look at. But basically, our entire two-way radio system encompasses either that radio or the mobile radio or the portable radio. And these guys' names still funny. And then we had an upgrade to the repeater station, uh, which can handle digital and analog signals uh, at the middle school. So I also brought, moving on. I also brought a new Chromebook case and an example of the new student Chromebook. So in prior years, we had uh, the case like, uh, like what's on Mrs. Shin's Chromebook, but now we kind of have a um, handle uh, briefcase style with zipper, um, identification card for the child right there, uh, easy to get at. Um, we find that a lot of other districts that have done this uh, really like it. And as I see kids in the hallway, you know, with stuff, this is a better option. It gives them another hand free. So I was pretty excited about that. Um, so this is what we're going to do with, um, as we flush in, as we rotate new Chromebooks in, they'll have this style of case. And I'll, I'll leave this over if somebody wants to check that out. And then we'll see if this works. I have a technical demonstration. This is what we consider a kindergarten Chromebook. And yep, sure, no battery here. So um, it's again, it does uh, flip around. This is for grade K. And as it boots up, we kind of got a screen here. It's taking a second to log in. And you see that the camera's activated. What I have in my hand is a QR code, which can I be, be identified with the kit. So instead of a kindergartner or first grader having to type in, a username and password. Um, just got to get close, and then it logs them into the system, brings their desktop up or whatever, quick link to IXL or whatever we need to put at the bottom, like that. So, anyway, just thought I'd show you that stuff. It will be over here at the table. And uh, I've, anybody else got any questions for me? I'm, well, I'll be available later when we get to my agenda item on the secondary staff laptop. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Good evening. <clears throat> um, just wanted to give a quick update on transportation. Uh, the beginning of the school year has gone pretty well. Um, like always, there's always lots of changes and it causes our bus times to fluctuate, but things like, seems like we're getting things smoothed out. Most of our changes have been in and processed and seems like things are settling down. <clears throat> Another good positive note is we've been able to provide transportation for both middle school and high school athletic events this year. Um, in fact, any team that has requested a bus, we've been able to provide that transportation for them. So I'm very happy about that. We have several <clears throat> new drivers for subs um, that are in the process of, of coming on board or in the training process. And I'm very excited about that. So that should help too with some of our staffing issues. And the last thing I had was we ordered our bus 45 back in November. We're anticipating delivery on that bus sometime before the end of 2023. So it's been a long process to get that bus here and 
we'll see how that goes. That's it. Any questions? Thank you. Good evening. I'm here with the operations report. Uh, the staff parking lot to the west of the middle school has been lined and ready for use, which it's already been in use for about a week. Um, we've had some things going on with the press box project. I have met with Martin, Martin Concrete and Hinojosa Contracting to start getting concrete bids for that so we can start to get ahead of the game. Uh, I asked the City of Croswell Light and Power to do a load test to ensure we have adequate power at the transformers behind the bleachers. Um, I'm waiting for the foreman of the crew to give me specifics, but he was on vacation. The head of the DPW went and did it. And he told me we have more than enough power to do the 100 amp panel at the press box at the transformers. Um, our fire suppression system that was due for updates are complete. The last remaining item was the fire pump at the high school. That was rebuilt on Wednesday. Our maintenance team was trained on the inspection and flushing procedure of the pump. And we have added windscreens with logos at the maintenance and ground shop fenced in area to give it a lot better look so we don't look like we're trash dumpster i guess per se and that's all i have any questions thank you Good evening, everyone. In the four short days of August, our participation increased 670 breakfasts and 1,833 lunches, which we see nothing but that going up. The issue is going to be the food supply. I'm already seeing commodities. They're hard to get. Any center of the plate items, they're already becoming a struggle. Um, I will continue trying to make sure that all of our meals clearly are compliant. I do see the MDE um, releasing some waivers in order to serve enriched products instead of only whole grain, seeing that all the schools in Michigan are offering meals at no cost. It's going to be a struggle, but we will continue to do our best. As you can see, the new serving line over at Frostic looks extremely sharp. The kids were super excited coming in, and it, it just looks really sharp. Um, the most important thing is Faye Kinney over at the middle school celebrated 33 years of service as of September 11th. So that was pretty exciting for her and for me to be able to be part of that. Any questions? All right, I'll Thank bring you. food next time. <laughs> Good evening. <clears throat> Um, roughly, we have about two, oh, just over 200 student athletes participate in fall sports this year. Uh, currently, there is just under 10 that are a dual sport athlete. Uh, regarding our scoreboard partnership that we have, uh, we have brought in 21,700 for a total from a total of 18 sponsors, with uh, potentially three more sponsors uh, reaching out to me about doing a sponsorship. Uh, we are about halfway over the uh, through the sports season this year. Um, Equestrian just competed this weekend and has won another district title. Uh, they advanced into regionals uh, September 29th through October 1st in Midland. So best of luck to them. We are hosting volleyball districts this year for the MHSAA playoffs. Uh, that is the last weekend of October. Cross country is heading to Anchor Bay October 27th. Uh, soccer will be heading to Richmond for districts. Uh, October 11th through the 21st. Tennis is heading to Bloomfield Hills Cranbrook, Cranbrook uh, starting October 11th. And then football, we will find out October 22nd uh, where they go. I do have some recognition I'd like to uh, give out first. Uh, first of all, Lori, uh, great transportation director. Uh, everything that we have asked for, she has basically given us. Um, coaches have been putting on the transportation sheet, so that's great, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, boosters, our athletic boosters have been tremendous. Um, they are going above and beyond every single night. Um, 
it's pretty much the same people working, but they have been doing a great job. Anything that the uh, the coaches have come to them to ask for, they have granted. Um, next, um, and this is because of you guys, our athletic trainer, Victoria Burns, um, absolutely amazing. Um, the other night, I had a parent reach out to me from Armada and said thank you for the treatment that she gave her son because the next day she had a uh, the son had hand surgery. So that was great that we're able to do that for not only our students every single day, but opposing schools as well when they come here. And then not last, or least but not last, is um, Heidi Lilly, um, my athletic coordinator. Right now she's pulling double duty uh, as coordinator and up front in the high school uh, office. Um, she's, she's doing great. She's able to keep up with me and keep up with uh, up front. So that's it. Any questions for me? Quick question. Yes. The three new sponsors you said for the football scoreboard. Yeah. Yep. Is that a one year sponsorship, multi year? So, so they do five years. Oh, nice. Um, and they have different packages that they can choose okay. from. So, so those three anywhere five 100, 500, um, 2,000, or 4,000. Very good. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Thanks. Next on the agenda is student representative report. Good evening. Just for a quick introduction, my name is Chelsea Pomaville. I'm a senior at Croswell Lexington High School. I'm involved in many activities such as band, student council, and NHS. So if I look familiar, that's why. I'm excited to be the student representative this year. School's in full swing and the pioneers are busy. The theater department is working on the first act of their show, Into the Woods, to be put on in November. The boys' tennis team recently won. As of last week, they are 1-1 in the BWAC and 1-3-1 overall. They have a match at home this week on Thursday. The pride of the Pioneers band has begun working on their fall music. They are looking forward to performing at football games with their Guardians of the Galaxy halftime show. Student Council had its first meeting of the school year. Both student council and making visions a reality are working hard on homecoming preparations. The boys soccer team is 3-3 in the BWAC. They look forward to the rest of their season. The football team is 4-0. The school is excited for the season to come. Cross country is off to a great season. They have been to five meets and the girls team has won three of said meets. Finally, volleyball has had 27 games. They have won 24 so far. The pioneers are off to a great school year. Thank you. Thanks. Old business done for new business. We're going to receive the presentation of the district annual education report. Mr. Wood. Thank you, President Nowiski. Um, on your table is our annual education report for 2023-24. So we'll just kind of walk through some of the highlights and some of the requirements that it meets. So our annual education report uh, is information on our strategic plan, as you see on the inside cover there, um, student assessment results, and school improvement plans. It also highlights other programs, opportunity, as well as important dates throughout the school year. Each building is required to complete their own annual education report, which we then post to our website. Um, this report meets, is designed to meet the federal requirements um, from the Every, Every Student Succeeds Act. So just to start off under the inside cover, you can see it's our strategic plan. Uh, this plan is basically expiring at this time. Um, so we will be updating that and creating a new strategic plan this school year. So we're excited to go through that process. Um, the strategic plan, as you guys know, guides our decision making. And so a heavy emphasis on students and staff well-being, building that positive culture. Um, so we're, with the experiences of COVID and the challenges of bringing students back and the learning, um, I see a lot of those same things popping up, um, but it's just been a, a great guiding um, for our decision making. So as we get started into the calendar itself, um, we've got September through December, focus on student achievement, and some of that we will see here later tonight with our spring 2023 reporting. Uh, but these areas focus on M-STEP results, which test students in English, Math, Science, and Social Studies. The eighth grade students take the PSAT in English and Math. Our freshmen and sophomore take the PSAT test as we flip through. And then the 11th graders or juniors take that all important SAT test. 
as we transition into the new year, into January. January focuses on our early childhood programming. Our early childhood programming includes both Pioneer Preschool, GSRP, and Latchkey. And then February through May focus on our building school improvement plans. So these plans are tied to our MyKIP goals. So we've got two MyKIP goals. We've continued to have the math goal improvement in that area, as well as a whole child goal focused on that whole child uh, meeting their social emotional needs, which we've seen with greater implementation of our SEL programming. And as we continue through um, the improvement plans, we then get to June, which then gives the community on a variety of topics and highlights our Pioneer High School and the opportunities it provides. So again, the many dates throughout, last day of school, fourth grade farewell, band performances, homecoming, dances, prom, um, as well as good information on how well our students are doing and our strategic plan that is leading our decision making. Any questions on the annual education report? Thank you, Mr. Wood. You're welcome. Next on the agenda is receive the presentation on the spring 2023 testing results, loss of learning plan. That's me again to get us started. Um, we do have the, the plan or the uh, report prepared here, so we've got it highlighted. We'll hear from all of our building principals on their individual building um, achievement. And then we'll have, uh, you know, you can ask any questions throughout or you can wait till the end. Um, but we are excited and pleased to present this year's report. Uh, as Ms. Moody said, the results are no longer embargoed, so we can share that with the community and the board tonight. So what we wanted to do just to start off, um, as we talked about in the strategic plan, or excuse me, the AER, some of the grade levels and when they're tested. So what we wanted to do is just show a comparison between last year and this year. So we've got proficient and above. So a student can be advanced, proficient, partially proficient, or not advanced. Um, so we always combine the advanced and the proficient category to see what percent of our students are achieving at that rate, okay, or at that achievement level. So we can see grades uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 11 in ELA, and then we see them in math and to do a comparison. So it's like, so for example, ELA 3, you see there for the percent proficient above um, 21, 22. So if you look then in 22, 23, that, that group of students would now be in fourth grade. So that's just to, as you kind of go through this to compare the students to where they were and then where they progressed. Um, that's kind of the best comparison. It's not really always a fair comparison to compare like ELA 3 over the years because the groups of students change, their needs change. So we try to track that growth over time um, to make similar comparisons. And then the social studies and science, those are just grades 5, 8, and 11. And that's part of the M-STEP testing. Any questions on that before we bring up Mr. Barr and Mr. Bartels to present the elementary achievement? Okay, gentlemen. Good evening. Um, in an attempt to continue to align horizontally across the district, um, me and Mr. Bartels are, are presenting our data together, which is a change from previous years. Um, we also, because of that, our graphs will look a little bit different. We're still giving you the same data, um, but the graphs look a little different. So um, I've got third grade ELA. Our percent proficient and advanced was 51.6 together. Um, which was almost 11% above the state average. That state average number was 40.9%. Um, so there were state, as a state, most numbers improved at least a little bit. Um, we continued to increase the gap between the state and, and our numbers. Third grade math on the M step, 
we had 61.6% proficient and advanced, um, which was actually almost 19% above state average um, for that group of kids. When we look at um, fourth grade ELA, um, we, are, we were at 61.8% proficient and advanced, which is quite a bit above the state proficient and advanced. Um, Mr. Barr and I talked about this quite a bit along with uh, Mr. Wood that we always want to be above the state uh, proficient and advanced. That, that would be the bottom bar because that's average. We always want to shoot higher than that. Um, and we do, uh, both staffs do a very good job with that. <clears throat> to piggyback on what uh, Mr. Uh, Wood said is this fourth grade ELA last year as third graders um, this 61.8 percent jumped 12 percent. So w when we look at numbers, w what he said, we agree 100 percent that we'd like to track them over time to make sure that we're improving over time. If we're at 80 percent, then we need to get to 85. If we're at 40 percent, we need to get to 50. So we're always striving to achieve. So we want to look at the same group of students uh, throughout their career. And um, proficient in math, 64 percent. Uh, quite a bit above the state again 38.6 percent um, here uh, we did improve we we're at 5.4 percent so we'll take it but we would like to um, increase that um, as we move forward and as we have them this year through this year to get them ready um, for fifth grade with um, over at the middle school long summer um, summer school this year, we had 56 attend. <clears throat> First time I've been a part of summer school. Um, I was very impressed with staff, uh, bringing a great attitude and smiles and enthusiasm every day. And I was shocked at the number of kids that wanted to be there. Um, there were very few that were kind of made to be there by their parents. Most kids came in, they were happy, they were sad it was Thursday because we didn't do it on Fridays. Um, so those were three great weeks. Um, and Mr. Barr and I um, oversaw them and worked with the teachers and the students during that time. And it also, the first day of school for us was a breeze because we already had three, like, get ready days with a third of the kids. So um, something that we're continuing with our instructional plans that we've done in previous years is the common grade level prep. Um, this has been, this has proven effective in both aligning horizontally and also um, three heads are better than one. So we get three grade level teachers together, um, share ideas, share new instructional strategies they may be using and try to continue to fill, fill any gaps that we might have. Yeah, during those meetings, um, it's very impressive to watch both staffs work together because they work in their PLC common planning time with that common prep. Um, some do it before school or after school but uh, most during that time, and they're reviewing data and instruction, um, so they're on the same page, like Mr. Barr said, and then it gives us a chance for our title teachers that are assigned to grade levels and special ed teachers to come in and give their input too to advocate for their kiddos. Uh, the next bullet point Mr. Wood touched on um, in his report, but we've got um, writing and social studies curriculum pilots. Uh, so writing, we're looking at in the first half of the school year, um, we're getting help from recess support to evaluate curriculums, determine which one will be the most effective for us, um, and continue to grow those ELA scores. Um, social studies will be a little bit longer into the school year, but about midway, um, we'll, we'll be evaluating that one as well. And um, social studies also builds into the ELA scores as well. The um Intervention programs uh, for myself last year was uh, my head kept spinning on how many we have, and you don't really understand that until you, you know you work with K through four, the different age groups, um, which ones are more geared for the lower level, which ones are more geared for the higher level elementary students. So we do have quite a few um, intervention programs, but these programs are great because it's not just putting a kid on a computer and and letting them be on it all day. <clears throat> Teachers strategically um, assign these lessons um, and programs for their students to meet them where they're, where they're at. And down another um, um, 
bullet point later on was the instructional aids. And our teachers um, have instructional aids for ELA and math. So when they're doing centers and they group their kids based on their tiers and what supports they need, a teacher works with a group, an aide will work with a group, and then as they rotate through these centers, a lot of times those instructional programs um, are used as a center. So they're not on it all day. They're just on it for a brief moment to help with a certain skill. Uh, we've also got assessments continuing this year. NWEA is still that like primary assessment that everybody takes. Um, from there, uh, we drill down into more specifics with the other assessments. Um, one of the new ones this year is numeracy consultants. It's, it's assessments and also um, it's got instructional supports um, to help with interventions for math programs. Our uh, title teachers, that numeracy consultants are, are being trained on it tomorrow and Thursday, um, along with some of our special ed teachers. Um, it's a fantastic program, and it's local in Michigan, the, the school district that came up with it downriver. Um, the collaborative teacher evaluation, uh, I will be 100% transparent, it is quite cumbersome. Um, it's quite a, a lot to this evaluation system, but the one nice thing about it is it's not an evaluation system just to give you a grade in the end. It's a communication back and forth throughout the year. It's more of a growth improvement model than just a valuation and you get a grade at the end. So um, that, that part of it is um, really good. And then I'm gonna finish with instructional coaching with Arisa. We work with um, Jennifer Evans. She's providing us literacy and writing. This year it's mainly gonna be writing to work with our teachers that are um, piloting those writing programs. She's gonna come out, um, what, she was here last week, she's gonna come out one day a month, work with all the Frostic teachers on Thursday, work with all the Meyer teachers on Friday, again, so that we're together um, working with those curriculums. And then Laura Chambliss does the project Lead the Way. And one other thing is we do use San Lac County ISD is a fantastic ISD as well. We get supports to them as well when we go to our trainings. And I know we've done some behavioral things um, with um, tiering our behavior supports through the ISD as well. So the Sandlack ISD, we, we lean on as well. All right. We will pass it over to Mr. Robbins. All right, good evening, everybody. Brad Robbins from the middle school here to do our data uh, for you this evening. Uh, I'll kind of take you through the slides and Go to the end piece as, to, as far as how we're supplementing curriculum and looking at intervention for uh, the overall goal of achieving higher and having our kids experience more growth. Um, you're looking at the middle school MSTEP data for ELA. Uh, proficient advance at the middle school last year in that group was at 61.2%. There you can see that well above the state level uh, in that regard. Um, I know that Mr. Wood mentioned, and he's correct in the fact that we track these groups um, there's two pieces to this that one of them is we track groups based on who they are as they go through the, the testing uh, through their career from one year to the next. But as Mr. Bartels mentioned about teacher evaluation, teachers are evaluated on the data that comes to them for the students that they have. So there are reasons to feel like you, you want to track both, I think, from uh, a district perspective and growth for each grade, for you know each kid moving up and achieving uh, greater things, that's good, but for our teachers and understanding where their best practices are and helping every group come through and improve their data as well. So I may make mention to a few things. If we look at this, we have some significant growth by grade um, in a few places that you know may have been concerning before, et cetera. So, uh, five and a half percent higher this year uh, than last if we compare years back and forth in ELA for fifth grade. Uh, these are our math scores. Uh, obviously still well above the state average. Um, working to get uh, some of those students who are in the partially and non up but still as I added onto these slides it's just a matter of math but when you see them together um, comparing you know, we like to look at the proficient and advanced. I added basically what the state is doing in non, um, you know, partially and not proficient just to compare it to that number. We had ours on there as well, but sometimes it's more jarring um, if it just sits there on its own. Science, we, uh, we were very strong in science throughout the building. 
Um, we continue to look that way, uh, well above the state average. Social studies is interesting. You'll see there's a trend throughout this, I think, um, and Mrs. Burns was just ragging on me over there about it. Uh, but the social studies, I think, speaks to um, the need for some further curriculum, which, to Mr. Wood's credit, we're looking at doing and piloting some new things um, and revamping. But you see it's not a necessarily a cross-lex issue. I think it's a, a focus issue. We, we spend a lot of times, especially at the lower levels, emphasizing, and rightfully so, um, math science and ELA, and sometimes that social studies piece doesn't get the attention, um, and we see that here reflected in these numbers. For sixth grade ELA, 45% proficient and advanced. Uh, this represents a 9% jump for us in, uh, from sixth grade's perspective from um, last year to this year, so I was pleased to see that jump. Math, again, outpacing, we did, did grow 13% by this grade, so it's not the group, it's the grade, um, but this was a 13% jump from the sixth grade performance last year. So something positive for that sixth grade math group to celebrate coming off of a, a good year of instruction. ELA, we are identical to the state proficient and advanced. I'd like to get that up as well. I'll talk a little bit about how we're trying to address that to climb over top at the end. And this is, I believe, the lone area, the seventh grade math group um, that's below. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And now going back to tracking groups um, instead of teachers necessarily. Uh, historically, this group is about right there in their performance as well as we track that trend through their middle school career thus far. Science, again, represents really well. Um, that curriculum does a great job, but so do our instructors. They're always well above. And there we see the trend for social studies as well. Um, speaking to a need to emphasize and revamp the curriculum in that regard from social studies perspective. PSAT numbers came back and they looked pretty good. Something that we changed. Um, I don't know if it made a huge impact, but the numbers did go up by about 5%. Uh, with this group, we had them test all together in one testing location uh, in the gym in a controlled environment with one proctor, which was me. Um, I don't know that that's going to be an option because they're moving to a digital version, and I don't think I can get enough extension cords in that room to keep everybody powered up. Uh, but we tried it for a year, and I think it was a positive change. It helped us uh, achieve some good results there. And there you can see um, performing at about the state level. Uh, in math, but that's an improvement for that group um, in general. So with all the data that we have in front of us, obviously it, it drives some of the instructional practices that we have and the changes that we've made in our building to try and grow our students. Um, we did also uh, run a summer school sec uh, section this year uh, in August. We had 38 students attend that, I believe, was the final number. I think we had 44 originally, and it dropped to about 38. We had three staff members, three groups, and all of them had uh, an instructional aid with them throughout that time. It was basically direct intervention through our IXL programming for those students. Um, we're going to do our NWA testing in the fall, winter, and spring, um, as well as the PSAT testing in the spring. And we're using common assessments and building those with our teachers to make sure that um, we're a little bit more aligned across our building. And also now that we're running more uh, credited classes at the high school for our eighth graders, we want to make sure that those classes have the same assessments that those students would be getting at the high school um, to keep everything with good uh, integrity there. We are doing the writing pilots, as Mr. Wood mentioned, uh, and piloting uh, social studies curriculum. Some intervention programs that we're utilizing. We have uh, PBIS initiatives and incentive for behavior and performance, which is at the middle school, that social emotional learning piece, and that positive behavior intervention supports. Um, they do have a direct connection to our ability to achieve in the classroom as well. So having that good, solid culture. Um, academic lunch for students who basically need to make up work because they're falling behind has been successful. And the goal is to not have very many students in there, uh, but it is an opportunity, and we have. Uh, highly qualified teacher in with them uh, during their lunchtime assigned 
to bring in their work and get that done. That happens in room 131 uh, three times a week. We have after school tutoring, which will be coming back here in the next couple of weeks, uh, working with Mrs. Cunningham to start that up after school. Attendance was decent last year in that, and I think as students become more familiar with that schedule, they're going to take advantage of that, which was really helpful. Um, these are some of the other programs we're using. I mentioned um, the NWA testing through IXL. IXL programming gives you an opportunity to take advantage of the NWA test that we run. Um, it spits out a RIT score. Our students are directly engaging with those RIT scores by setting a goal sheet with their teacher at each individual class, writing it down and monitoring it. And students who are um, in intervention classes, which I'll talk about in a moment, are using that IXL score. It creates specific practice just for that student based on their strengths and weaknesses through the NWA testing. So we're taking something that the district pays for and finds value in, uh, and then we're trying to implement an intervention that goes directly alongside of that. Uh, we have interventions now. So previously, uh, we were running some blocked classes, which just meant the students were taking a longer amount of time in math or uh, English. And we really try to drill that down and make direct intervention classes. We now have direct intervention classes for math at all grade levels, um, fifth through eighth. We have ELA intervention as well. Uh, fifth grade is still blocked English. There's some personnel reasons to make sure that that works. Also a little bit more development and consistency with the grade level that they're at. It's kind of a nice way to ease them into a uh, middle school. They have one teacher that they have twice a day. Think of it as a reading block and a writing block, and then we mix the rest up throughout the day. Uh, but if you're a sixth grader, uh, seventh grader, or eighth grader, and we found that through your NWA test, you were in our bottom 30% performance-wise, you likely have an elective that does direct intervention for you to address and move you along. Interventions are, um, you can enter and exit those things. They don't have to be permanent. They, they should have off ramps. If you're finding success, you go into other areas where you can find additional success. We added um, pre-algebra. So at, at, we looked at trying to get some of those kids who are proficient to advance or moving those kids who are um, high achievers and giving them an intervention as well. Uh, we added a pre-algebra seven class, which um, is a little bit quicker in, in the way that the curriculum is delivered. And they're going to experience a lot more of the eighth grade uh, curriculum early and preparing uh, very likely for algebra one, trying to set those kids up in algebra one for some more success early on. And we've got more high school credits. I mentioned that before. BMA and health are in our building now. Um, and then through our collaborative 5D process with the teacher evaluation model, uh, we're really, really trying to focus on, we're calling it the Lids Down initiative, a lot more student engagement. Uh, COVID uh, pushed a lot of our things online, which is a great tool for us. But we found that students really are lacking a lot of those soft skills, interaction, collaborative pieces. Uh, it's a little bit like pulling teeth to get them to talk to you, and we're trying to um, involve them a little bit more in that way. It, it speaks to that culture and, and trying to build uh, on our curriculum in a way that is going to be more meaningful for our students. That's all for me, unless you have questions for me. All right. Mrs. Burns. My charts look a little different than those guys, but so does my test. So we'll kind of go through a little bit here, class by class, just like everyone else said. You can compare year to year, and that's fine. But if you're not watching the growth within the class, you really are missing the big picture there. Um, you got to meet them where they are and then take them where you want them to go. And that's just a little bit of a different approach than what many will take. So this is looking at our current sophomore class when they started. At the bottom of the chart will tell you kind of when they started, when they came in, and where they're ending up overall. So just in that year, going from spring 22 to spring 23, we brought that group up about 33 points on the composite. Not easy to do with a ninth grade class. They're just learning about high school. They're trying to get it all figured out. It's the first time that they sit down and take that in a, you know, in a heavy environment like what Mr. Robbins described. So I'm um, still pretty proud of this group, even though they landed themselves just a little bit behind the state there. I threw the the state averages up there with our English, that ERW, that's English, 54% um, meeting the benchmark where the state was 59. 
um, in the math, we had 37% of our kids meeting the benchmark with the state at 41. So we are behind them a little bit, but there's a lot of room to grow with this class. Um, and like I said, we plan on moving them forward as quickly as we can. So this is just a kind of a chart that, that shows where those kids land. And this is kind of a trend that we've been seeing over the past couple of years. Um, where it's almost like a divided, it's almost divided. You've got the kids that are meeting the benchmarks and then the kids that are not. And that middle group, that yellow zone is the approaching the benchmark. Um, that group got smaller from, from last year to, to this year, um, but more of them moved ahead in that group. So that was actually not a bad thing. We're gonna need to work on getting that bottom um, set that needs to strengthen skills that's marked over there in the red, moving them forward. And we've got a couple years to do that. Um, so this is our current junior class. This is the group that will be taking the, S, the SAT this year in terms of where they went. Um, this is a group that, that we are very, very proud of. Um, from the st time they started with us till this past spring, 87 plus 87 growth in two years is pretty impressive. The previous uh, class that just graduated in three years only did 99, and this group's done 87 in two years. Um, I'm a person that likes to talk about data, but that's a big jump. That's, a, that's, that's an impressive jump after two years. To move them up 87 points in the composite, you can see they're just chasing the state right there, just behind it. We're talking about a question or two there. Really, in terms of composite, you're not, we're not that far behind. And considering where they were, um, we've kind of brought them a long way. And that's that part of that tracking within the class, like all the other principals have talked about so far. Um, and I like to compare this group to the state when I was um, giving the teacher some kudos on this. We, in two years, we took them 87 plus 87 on the composite where the state average only went up 47 in those two years for everybody else. That's nearly double the growth um, in comparison to their peers of the same age taking the same test. And again, you're gonna see that divide with that group again. And we're still trying to make sure that we're moving those kids forward and approaching the benchmark. What I'm most proud of in this group is the math. The math kids were completely, this group was completely divided the year before, and we've moved a lot of kids into that approaching the benchmark with one more year where they're coming in to take the SAT this year. So I'm pretty pleased with what, um, what has happened math-wise. Um, as a former math teacher and um, lover of all things data, I, I really am impressed with what this group, this particular class has done. Um, this is our current seniors. This will be Chelsea's class um, on the board right now that they have finished through their entire testing cycle, so two a year from fall um, to the start. And I told you the previous senior class that graduated last year, they had, a, they had a change of 99, 99 points. And we were like, oh, wouldn't it be great if we got 100? Wouldn't we be great if we got 100? Well, Chelsea's class decided they were going to go well beyond that, and they're at 140. It's a growth of 140 on the composite from freshman year to junior year. That is nothing short of extraordinary, and we're very, very proud of this group and how far they've gone. The state composite did go up 124, um, but you can see that this group is meeting the is ahead of the benchmark for the state in the SAT, where the test really does change. There's a big difference, um, and you can ask the kids. There is a big difference between that PSAT and that SAT. It is much different, um, and the stress is immensely high. And there is, I'm not sure what principal would have guessed that it was going to be 85 degrees in the classrooms on the day that they took this SAT, but it sure wasn't me. And the popsicles that I gave them evidently worked because they did some pretty great stuff. 61% um, meeting the benchmark versus the state being at 51. Um, and 30%, and they, they're above the benchmark in math. And being above the benchmark in math is a big deal. It's something that this group had kind of hovered around and hovered around, and we're just below and just below. And I know they're only 1% above, but that 1% is a big 1% from where they started. So we're very, very proud of, uh, of this group as well. Um, Mr. Wood has some data coming up here that will tell you that this group was top in our county and also third in the BWAC, um, which is pretty impressive as well. Um, above the state in both math and English, like I said. Um, and the, uh, the three lowest percentage times where they were meeting the benchmark, their three lowest percentage of meeting the benchmark were in fall testing, not in spring. And I'll remind you again that we're a, it's very rare for a school to test everyone, grade 9, 10, and 11, on that NMSQT in the fall. We are a school that does that. Typically, only, school, only kids that are trying to be merit scholars or trying to go for those biggest scholarships and things like that are taking that. It's voluntary. We test everyone. So the fact that we stay competitive in the, small, in the fall, even, in, even the spring being competitive is great. The fact that we stay competitive with the state, with everybody else in the fall as well, is a, is a much bigger, more important statistic in, in the, the grand scheme of things because we're testing everyone, and it's hard to move that needle for everyone. So 
similar trend with this group, but kind of starting to reverse that. A lot more kids showing up in that green zone. Uh, and when it comes to the SAT and we're showing up more kids in that green zone, that's a good thing. That's a much harder test. Um, and it's the, the biggest one for them. It's the biggest one that counts. It's the one that they get so stressed and, and for lack of better words, freaked out about because it is the one, right? And we talk a lot about things and Chelsea's nodding because I'm sitting there telling them the score doesn't define you. You're going to be great. And we, and we go through it and it is, it's a lot of pressure for them. So to see that green zone get a lot of bigger, got a lot bigger with this group and that plus 140 is something that we are immensely proud of at the high school. Um, for our MSEP, um, we, we are above the state here with the science. Um, with the proficient advance, we have 45%. The state proficient advance was 39, so we're proud of that as well. Um, we don't get a lot of data about the M-STEP test in terms of preparation, so it's very difficult sometimes for us to see like where it is that we can improve. It's kind of like just teachers using their own data from interim assessments and things like that for figuring out where kids are gonna go. And to be perfectly honest, it's very difficult to motivate high schoolers for this test because it doesn't have any money attached to it and it doesn't have any bearing on whether they get into college. And they know that because they're very smart as I just went through and showed you about that class before. Um, same with social studies though, we are, we are beating the mark there. Um, the state proficient advance was 36% and at the high school we are 43.5. So we're very proud of, again of the kids putting in the effort on that test. It is very hard if they took a five hour SAT a th one day, the three hour word keys the next day, they walk in the next day and they take this M step on the third day. They're tired, it was hot, it was awful. They killed it, they did a great job, we're very proud. It was awful, wasn't it Charles? It was so hot in those rooms. Um, as far as instructional plans um, for this year, we will be testing again this fall. We're testing all students. The test is moving to a digital format. Um, I have done a lot of um, education myself this summer. Um, I forwarded a webinar to Dallas that he attended last week to get himself prepared as a tech director for what's coming with the digital testing this fall. So the first time we're all doing it. Um, and I am attending with a team this Friday, another webinar from the high school to learn how to get ready for test day. We've got our kids loaded in, we're working through that. It's just a matter of getting all the logistics for test day down, um, but we'll be doing that. Last year was the first time that we changed. I enrolled every teacher with the college board so they now, all, every teacher can get on the college board and get the data from the kids fall testing. Last year um, on the March early release day, I, I got them all set up before March, but on the March early release day, we went through and spent those two hours going through that data and creating targeted review for our kids in the spring. I truly believe that that contributed to the success that we saw in the spring, and we'll do that again this year. And I think the teachers found some really good value and really good things to use on their assessments, found some um, you know, more questions to use so that these kids are getting more practice with it. And it's not just test practice, but things we do all the time. We're still using, um, our interim assessment schedule. Kids will be taking the interim assessments in most classes coming up here in the next week or so, and then October we'll be looking at data analysis for that. Um, we're using IXL in grades 9, 10, and 11. I just got a notification from IXL this week that my kids have answered 10,000 questions already this year in English language arts, so that tells you that the teachers are using this regularly in the class in all grade levels. Um, that's kind of an impressive mark. I sent that to the English department. They were kind of shocked that they had um, that many, but it was kind of neat. Our math supports, um, we did make some changes. Um, we used to have a pre-algebra class at the high school and decided rather than um, trying to dissect all that out, we were gonna use some data from Mr. Robbins and the PSAT and we, we kind of removed the pre-algebra class and put an algebra one class that's moving just a little bit slower pace. So the kids are getting a little bit more rigor but at a slower pace. I truly believe that that will make a little a more, different, um, more difference to them. It'll be a little bit more challenging but we're gonna give them a little bit more time to increase those algebra skills as they move forward. And then we still have the Algebra 2 103 class which has been around for a lot of years. It's a class that Mr. Wood started I believe that is still kind of um, in the realm as that goes. That's just, it's an Algebra 2 class and goes at a little slower pace. As a former math teacher, I can tell you the concepts in Algebra 2 are very difficult for many students and, and that is a very beneficial um, thing that we have to teach them at a little bit slower pace so that they have a chance to grasp onto something that is not really um, readily available or easy to see when it comes to math. Uh, we did summer school this year in June instead of August. We were kind of the black sheep of the group in terms of that. We did everything a little bit differently at the high school and that's totally okay. Um, we just um, 
my philosophy this year when I changed everything over was it might be easier to drag that caboose into summer school than it would be to get that engine started in August, and it worked. We are very successful in um, passing classes in summer school by keeping those kids in school. We started right away, just kind of had a lot of different things going on there. Um, and um, we're very proud of like what our kids are doing, what our teachers are doing. They've got a lot of things going on that are very positive. Um, I had just this week, we were, or last week, we were recognized again um, by U.S. News and World Report, at least as many years as I've been there for something different, um, that, um, that we were one of the best high schools. That's based on the scores from some of these tests and our AP scores. So I'm not sure how many years in a row, I might have to get that information from Mr. Wood, but it's least, it been at least every year since 2020 um, that we'll be recognized that way. I also recognized 10 students at the high school this week for a National Rural and Small Town Award from the College Board, which is based on their um, success in AP scores, NMSQT, PSAT. It's not easy to do that. That's the highest number of students we've recognized with that. I think there were three or four last year, but um, we're doing really good things. I'm proud of the direction that the high school is headed in. I'm not sure if you were going through this. Any questions for me regarding high school? Kyle, when we're looking at the elementary and the middle school more, and I see what she's doing, I'm focusing on the partially and non-proficient. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of shocking when you see percentages above 50%. Do we ever look at separating those? Because the partially maybe, uh, hopefully, is more than the non-proficient, and the partially may be just a question or two to boost them up kind of like Lisa was showing us, that middle graph. Do we ever do that with the middle and the elementary grades to see, oh, we're, you know, we do have this, you know, we have whatever it was, like 40% were proficient, but we had 15% that were partially, and, you know, a question or two more, it'll boost that up, and then our non-proficient doesn't look as shocking when we see that number up there, you know, 53% and the non-proficient, you're like, what the heck are we doing? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll do the best I can, but Mr. Robbins can hop in. But that kind of goes along, too, with what Ms. Burns was saying, that some students, like you're saying, are only a question or two away. Um, and so what we try to do is build that in. I know Mr. Robbins and I have had extensive conversation on changing that intervention schedule instead of having, for example, all students in English or ELA block two hours a day to have more targeted intervention with those bottom 30%. Okay. Um, and I think that also will tie to, as Mr. Robbins said, the idea of get common assessments. So students in all levels in the same class are taking the same assessment. They get a better point of data comparison as well. Um, anything to add to that, Mr. Robbins? Is that something that's pretty simple to segregate out those two things? What percent of that 53% is partial and what percent is just non-proficient? Yeah. It is out there. Right. We, we lump them together and yeah. we look at them. Uh, but you can see your nons at the bottom, right? So if you're looking at your partially versus your nons. So, we're so you're yellow and you're red. Yeah. So yeah. you're grouping you're those red. together. Red is almost certainly in an intervention class okay. and, and needing to move up to at least partially. But that group that's in yellow, we're hopeful, but not certain. Are close that, that to get right. Yeah. You don't know how close they are to proficient either. You know, like right. that's the, the tough part. So you're trying to intervene through all those different things that we mentioned to get them to yeah. the green. 
in the M step, as uh, we've kind of discussed, it doesn't give great test results. I know when I was a building principal, my science and social studies teachers would ask for it, and I would we would go through the reports, yeah. and it's very vague, very generic. College Board and the item analysis, and especially previously where you could see the questions that was given, right. and then you could look at the item analysis and say, oh, this is why this was a confusing question. Right. And then when we create our interim assessments, our common assessments, it was mandatory that they worked in SAT-style questioning into their testing. So I think that's what we're trying to get to more at the middle school level as well. Um, but ideally, the MSTEP in the state of Michigan could provide better data analysis for us on the test too. I just think seeing that that number, if maybe just hearing that red number instead of the combined number wouldn't yeah. be so shocking. Yeah. But, well, there's some okay. preparation. That's why I added what the state was. Right. Yeah. Like, that was, that was like, I, was, I had the same reaction as you, but I, then I started to look at what's honestly normal. Not that it's good. Right. Okay. Thank you. So we did want to um, provide some county comparisons as well. So we went into, and all this information is publicly available at MI School Data. Um, this is where we pulled it off from. But just to give you kind of a, a comparison at the county level for those grades, um, three through eighth, and then in ELA and math. So you can kind of see, and again, this is the percentages, the numbers on there are the percent that are either advanced or proficient for each school district. Top 10%. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know if we're necessarily in the top 10%, but um, as Ms. Burns said, we are recognized for being one of the highest through the U.S. News and World Report, and we've gotten that or earned that multiple years in a row. So, I mean, I don't know if I'd say the top 10%, but we're definitely one of the better achieving districts in the state. And then we also wanted to provide a little more comparison as far as with some schools locally and in the BWEC. And again, that three through eighth in ELA and math. We also wanted to provide the SAT, the all important test, um, and how we did at the county level. As Ms. Burns, we were the highest in the county, so something to celebrate for sure. I put on here also the English, so the e English reading writing score, the percent that were college ready in that, and as well as math. And then some similar comparisons, SAT, with those same um, BWAC schools. We just kind of like picked some random ones, St. Clair close by, um, just to give some close comparisons. And you can see how we stacked up there with some of those schools. And that is our spring 2023 data report. Any other questions that the board has? Thank you. You're welcome. Need to take a quick step back and we need a motion and a support to approve the district annual education report that Mr. Wood provided. Can I get a motion? motion by Stelson supported by Shin to approve the district annual annual education report this will be by roll call Noel yes O'Hare yes Maxie yes 
Stilson? Yes. Gardner? Yes. Shin? Yes. MES? No nays. Second, we need a motion and support to approve the purchase. of the secondary instructional staff laptops. Ms. Dallas presenting on that. Yeah, he's coming out. A quote was included with your yes. board pack. Um, the secondary staff have the oldest, for staff, the oldest devices. And so this has been a purchase that he's been working on for a little bit of time. I figured you want to speak on that, Dallas. I didn't want to leave you out, so. No, thank you. So the the um, the pricing, um, well, this is part of state pricing that we have every year. So somewhere between um, late spring until the end of September, we have this pricing. And uh, uh, Dell come in as the lowest bid. Uh, they beat out uh, Lenovo and HP. I did note that um, on the uh, quote inside of your board pack, it has uh, a staff uh, instructional laptop and then a second laptop uh, for the I'm going to say the, the heavy video users for the, the people around the security system quite a bit to handle all the feeds coming in and stuff like that um, these prices are roughly I was doing some numbers 66 off of retail pricing so educational pricing is somewhere about 75 percent or you know 25 percent lower but this is like pretty impressive pricing so like if you were to buy you know, uh, item, that basically, I'm not going to go into numbers right now, but it's 66% more <laughs> if you were to buy it in the store. So if there's any other questions on that. But that's good price is what I'm saying. So well, you've got stuff. No questions. Can I get us moved and supported by to approve the purchase of the secondary no. instructional staff laptops? by Max, and supported by Gardner, to approve the purchase of the secondary instructional laptops as presented. This will be right by roll call. Stilson? Yes. Shin? Yes. Gardner? Yes. Maxi? Yes. Noel? Yes. O'Hare? Yes. Amy? Yes. No nays. Motion carries. Thank you, board. Next is to approve the contract for the interim high school assistant principal. Ronald Miller, you want to speak on that, Ms. Moody? I do. Um, Mr. Miller is um, agreeing, and he is here with us, so you can see who he is, to uh, come in and be an interim assistant principal while Mr. Vestich is out on a medical leave. He, Mr. Miller, is a retired principal from St. Clair High School. He has 19 years' experience as a principal and 12 as an assistant principal, so he's bringing a wealth of experience to the role and is... Um, we're grateful to him that he's willing to step in and bring that experience and share it with us and help us get through until Mr. Vestich is able to return. Thank you. Looking for a motion of support to approve the contract for the interim high school assistant principal, Ronald Miller. I'll make a motion to approve the contract for the interim high school principal, assistant principal, uh, Mr. Miller. Moved by Stilson, supported by O'Hare, to approve the contract for the interim high school assistant, Ronald Miller, being the principal. This will be by roll call. Gardner? Yes. Maxie? Yes. Noel? Yes. O'Hare? Yes. Shin? Yes. Stilson? Yes. Ami, yes. No nays. Motion carries. Need a motion of support to adjourn the meeting. Moved by Gardner, supported by Noel, to adjourn the meeting at 8.14 p.m. Roll call, Maxie? Yes. Noel? Yes. Shin? Yes. O'Hare? Yes. Stilson? Yes. Gardner? Yes. I'm a yes. No nays, motion carries. <laughs>